Donald Trump's critics see the man as a menace to the Constitution. No, 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 says our guest today. It's just the other way. Donald Trump, a champion of the Constitution. Uncommon knowledge now. I'm Peter Robinson. Welcome to another special Plague Time edition of Uncommon Knowledge. John Yu is a professor at the University of California at Berkeley School of Law and a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution. Professor Yu served as Deputy Assistant U.S. Attorney General in the Office of Legal Counsel during the administration of President George W. Bush. He is the author of a number of books on the Constitution and the presidency, including Just Out, Defender in Chief, Donald Trump's Fight for Presidential Power. John, I'm at home in Palo Alto. Where are you? I'm uh, at the St. Regis Hotel in Washington, D.C., overlooking the Black Lives Matter mural right in front of the White House. A excellent. W where you should be, I suppose. Okay. Threshold question. We'll get to all the arguments in your book, but here's the threshold question. Is Donald Trump a legitimate president? Quote, defender in chief. Trump became only the fifth president, along with presidents such as John Quincy Adams and George W. Bush, to lose the popular vote, but win a majority of votes in the Electoral College. Law professor Akhil Amar has declared, and now you're quoting Akhil Amar, standard civics class accounts of the Electoral College rarely mention the real demon, dooming, direct national election when the founders drafted the Constitution, slavery. Donald Trump won 3 million votes fewer than Hillary Clinton, but wins a majority in the Electoral College, which the founders only invented because of slavery. John? Well, Peter, thanks for having me on the show again. I miss my partner in crime, Richard Epstein, but we just couldn't get him to write a book saying nice things about Trump. So <laughs> out he had to go. Uh, thanks a lot for having me about this book. And I want to explain, you know, I didn't start out as a Trump supporter. You know, mm. I'm not a, you know, a diehard Trump guy. I wasn't a never Trumper either. But over time, I've come, I think, closer to the view that Trump is a legitimate president and that he has been exercising traditional constitutional powers of the presidency. And I think you're raising the Electoral College is a good example. I think Trump has been on the receiving end of wave after wave of attacks to try to create the impression that he is somehow an illegitimate president. But in fact, he is the one selected through the working of the Electoral College, the way we've chosen presidents for over 200 years and the one designed by the framers. If you think Trump's illegitimate, you think the Electoral College is illegitimate. And there are many people on the Democratic Party or the far left, I would say, actually, not the Democratic Party, right now who are demanding the abolition of the Electoral College process. Oh, but, uh, that's a centrist Democratic position, isn't it? Hasn't Hillary Clinton called for the abolition of the, of the Electoral College? So I, in other I, words, I, you, you, you've set it up perfectly because in this, you've got two things going on here. The book, brilliantly, it pains me to give you a compliment, of course, John, you, are so, you and I are such good friends, <laughs> but the book very, it just, brilliantly shows, and we'll come to these arguments, that one way after another in which Donald Trump has defended the Constitution of the United States. But then you've got this second underlying argument. Oh, it's 248 years old, that claptrap document that had to take account of slavery in the first place. It's the, who cares if he defends that old document? Right, I wrote the book before the 1619 Project, before all the attacks on our institutions and monuments today. But the Electoral College is not some ramshackle window dressing for slavery, which is, I'm sure, what you would read about in the New York Times. That's exactly fact, right. It balances these competing concerns. On the one hand, the framers did not want the president to be picked by Congress. That was the other competing method of selection because they saw from the state constitutions bad things would happen if the executive was just the mere agent of the legislature. They quoted Montesquieu, who would have this aphorism, the combination of the executive, the power to execute the laws and make the laws was the very definition of tyranny. It's a mm -hmm. maxim they repeated over and over again. So on the one hand, 
they wanted the president to be chosen in a way other than through Congress. At the same time, they didn't want to have a direct popular election. The Constitution, in many of its aspects, is actually anti-democratic. It is a Republican form of government. It tries to slow down and dilute direct democracy. They didn't want to have direct election of president because they also feared demagogues and dictatorship. And so the Electoral College, it does give the people the voice, the choice of the president, but it ameliorates it through the states, right? It's really the state legislatures right. that pick the electors. And then through the idea of giving smaller states a slightly, slightly greater say, because as you know, the electoral college votes are allocated by members of the house plus two. So if you're Delaware, you get three votes, not one. And in cl very close elections, that throws the elective states a balance, uh, some somewhat greater balance in the say of who's present. You can see it seems a little bit ramshackle, as you said, when you look at it. And I can't think of any other countries that have such a system right now. But at the same time, you can see how it tried to balance in between these two competing designs. The framers tried to pick something in the middle. And in the current moment, it's important to note that, that as I take your argument, slavery had nothing to do with it. There was the three-fifths clause elsewhere in the Constitution, but there's nothing in the debates, the constitutional debates, concerning the electoral college that touches on slavery. Is that correct? There is one sentence said by, made by an obscure framer in the Constitutional Convention that says, oh, well, maybe the electoral college will give some advantage to the Southern states. And he doesn't say slavery, doesn't explain why. From that one sentence, despite all the other comments about the Electoral College, which never mentioned slavery, don't talk about it, this argument that it's racist has arisen. Uh, but the second thing is, if the Electoral College was racist in 1787, then every other aspect of the Constitution is similarly racist, right? Because the members of the House are allocated under the three-fifths clause, as you mentioned. So the members of the House is racist. The Senate gives greater votes to states that, rather than to the people. So that must be racist too. So uh, right, the Electoral College, if you think about it, is the least infected body in the government. I see. And then after the Civil War and after Reconstruction, when the three-fifths clause is eliminated, all that's removed. And you can't say today that the Electoral College has anything to do with slavery or racism. All right. So Donald Trump is a constitutionally, is a constitutionally legitimate president of the United States. And whatever your disagreements on the Constitution three-fifths clause in 1788, when the document is ratified, nobody has any claim against the Electoral College in 2020. Right. All right. All right. So, John, defender in chief, Trump's battle for the Constitution has taken three basic forms, and you're going nowhere until we get through all three. First, he fought Robert Mueller's special counsel investigation and the Ukraine impeachment. Well, we'll come to impeachment in a moment. First, the Mueller investigation, which consumed more than two years of the Trump administration. For that matter, it consumed two years of the nation's energies. Uh, Trump is fighting for his survival. Why would you glorify a base political struggle for survival as a defense of the Constitution? The Constitution always does that. That's the beauty of it. I don't even argue that Trump knows he's doing this, right? I don't even make a claim that Trump is consciously defending the Constitution. Of course, he's fighting for his self-preservation, his political future in the Mueller report and impeachment. This is the beauty of the Constitution, is that it tries to funnel people's political self-interest into a greater constitutional good. And this is James Madison in the Federalist Papers. He said, the way the Constitution is meant to work is that ambition must counteract ambition. Uh, the interests of the man must be connected to the interests of the place. By that he meant, yeah, Donald Trump, Nancy Pelosi, you pursue your political self-interest. The fighting between the president and Congress and the judiciary, the conflict is what will keep the government within its bounds. And that will be the best protection of individual liberty, far more than going to the courts and suing or writing down all the rights we could think of in the Bill of Rights, which 
they famously called mere parchment barriers. It really was a Donald Trump who should defend himself, who should stand up for executive privileges, executive rights, that in a way helps guarantee that the government as a whole doesn't get out of control and then it becomes so big and so powerful, it's a threat to our individual liberties. So I, again, I'm not making a claim that while he's fighting Mueller, Trump is saying is, you know, maybe a constitutional scholar like uh, me or, you know, former White House official like you would sit there and go, he's got to protect the prerogatives of the presidency. This special counsel is an outrageous tumor on the, right, the purity of an executive branch responsible to a single president with the power of removal through all the subordinates. He, I don't think he thought that. That was what he was achieving by fighting Mueller so much. And that is a greater constitutional good. All right. The seriousness of what was taking place during the Mueller investigation. Again, I'm quoting you, John, defender in chief. This is a longish quotation, but it's very important. I'm sure it is beautifully, beautifully written. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> I am sure it sounds even better than it reads, unlike Wagner. <laughs> After November 8th, 2016, election day. FBI Director James Comey and the FBI leadership could have recognized the constitutional authority of the new president, Donald Trump. They could have informed Trump of the investigations into his campaign and asked him whether they should continue. If they believed that Trump had interfered with a valid investigation out of his own self-interest, they could have resigned and taken their concerns of a cover-up to Congress. Instead, they treated the new president himself as a target and then dared Trump to stop them, close quote. Now, tell me I'm not being hysterical, but as I review outrages against the Constitution in the course of this country's history, I come up with the Southern states seceding, and then I come up with this the law enforcement agencies of the federal government rejected a constitutionally elected president of the United States or refused to accept his legitimacy and began to undermine his administration before he had even taken office. Again, tell me to calm down, please. But that just strikes me as one of the great constitutional outrages in this nation's entire history. Well, uh, let's not forget. Right. Let's not forget basically everything LBJ thought of doing every time he stepped foot in the Oval Office to begin the day. <laughs> but, right. but or let's not forget Watergate and Nixon. But uh, there, uh, oh, the this reason is, no, why actually serious point, serious point. Yeah. The FBI and we and it seems clear the other intelligence agencies are in on it too, undermining the President of the United States. That that makes Watergate. That makes Nixon's ridiculous little plumber's operation look like a trifle doesn't it? He tried to use those same agencies to pursue his political opponents. All right, all right. The thing enough. that makes this bad is that the same agencies went after another major political party's presidential candidate on their own, at their own direction. And I'm not sure which one's worse, uh, but let me say, I, I just want to point out, there is, again, you point out, there is the trench warfare about Comey firing him about all the headquarters staff at FBI trying to run an investigation, which they are never supposed to do, out of Washington, D.C., downtown headquarters against a sitting, first a, a candidate of a major political party, and then a sitting president. But I, I think the point I want to make is there's a larger constitutional uh, principle at stake here, which is, and, and, and it goes back to the difference between the founding and then the way the Constitution was changed by the progressives at the, at the beginning of the 20th century, which is, Right, under, I think, the vision that Trump fought for, even though he may not realize it, that's the version of the founders, which is the president's elected. He is the only one in the Constitution charged to enforce, see that the laws are faithfully executed. Right. Everybody who works for him is an assistant. He can fire any of them. He can order all of them around. But they're all just there to help him enforce the law. The vision brought in by Woodrow Wilson and the progressives, the vision that I think Jim Comey thought that he was pursuing and that the Washington elites support is, no, no, government's too hard for elected politicians. Right. We should have experts 
technicians, scientists in charge, professionals. They should do their jobs as insulated and free from political control as possible. Right? That's Jim Comey. He's such, he thinks he's such a professional. He gets to override the results of the 2016 election. He right. gets to decide who's fit or unfit to be president. That is not just right, Comey versus Trump. That is also the conflict between two very different visions of the Constitution. And I argue in the book that Trump is trying to return us back to the more Spartan idea of government and the executive branch. Comey, in a way, is fighting for this idea of, and maybe even Comey doesn't realize it, technocratic, scientific government of the kind that Woodrow Wilson would have loved. So we had, we heard over and over and over again, you still hear it. Oh, yes, but the independence of the FBI must be protected. Where? It's ridiculous, isn't it? It's anti-constitutional. The anti -constitutional. idea that you should have uh, independent, the only independent branch should be around is the judiciary. No part of the executive branch, if you read the constitution, it doesn't talk or make provision for any kind of branches that should be independent from right. president, because that's how we hold them accountable through our uh, electoral, our elected representatives. All right. Executive prerogative, quoting Defender in Chief again, the second of the three main ways Trump has defended the constitution Quoting Defender-in-Chief, he stood up for traditional executive leadership, close quote. Now, you make quite a lot of Alexander Hamilton and his famous comment in Federalist Number 70, in which Hamilton insists on energy in the executive. Federalist papers are arguing that the Constitution should be ratified. Nevertheless, they are extra-constitutional documents. What? Explain that. Explain the importance of what Hamilton says and how it relates to our understanding of the function of the executive, the correct functioning of the executive. Yeah. Also, let me just say, you know, the uh, Federal's papers are extra constitutional, but they are almost, this will appeal to the White House speechwriter in you. They are the best written speeches in favor of the Constitution. They are unbelievable, yes. yes. Yeah, and they are talking points. They are spread throughout. The basic arguments are shared all throughout the state ratifying conventions amongst the Federalists. And so they are more than uh, newspaper op-eds. You know, not that either you and I have anything to say <laughs> criticizing newspaper no, op-eds. No, no. That's how we make a living. But it's they are more than that. They are very deeply philosophical. They're amazing. They might Some people think it's America's greatest contribution to political science is the Federalist Papers. And uh, they, they are seen as an authoritative explanation for many questions about the Constitution. And so what Hamilton was talking about there, and you know Hamilton's got to be right because they made a Broadway musical about him and they don't make God, Broadway God. musicals about unimportant people. Actually, I want to produce a, a Broadway musical about Madison. That's clearly going to be the next hit. Madison, exclamation point. All right. <laughs> but anyway, so Hamilton's view is... Keep your day job, John. <laughs> So Hamilton's uh, view of Federalist Number 70, he is trying to explain why is there a president at all? There was no independent separation of uh, an executive from the legislature under the Articles of Confederation. Most states at this time picked the governors through Congress, through the assembly. They basically had uh, prime minister, almost prime minister systems like in England, you know, parliamentary right. systems. Right. So Hamilton's reacting to it's attack after attack on this new constitution. Like, where does this president come from? Why are you giving him such powers? Why are you making him independent of Congress when everybody else makes the governor subject to the control of the assembly? And he says, uh, right, he, it's interesting, in Federal Number 70, he explains it quite clearly, and it goes back to Locke, to Hobbes, to Machiavelli, this idea that the executive has to be concentrated in one person because it needs to act with energy, with swiftness, with decisiveness, because, and this is his main point, the executive is the only part of government that's always in being, that's always there to react to emergencies, crises, unforeseen circumstances, to protect the nation, and then to enforce the law. And he said, what has happened at the states, when you combine the executive and legislative branches, when Congress becomes too powerful, Hamilton said, you have oppression. He said, that's, the, that's when you start to see the oppression of minorities. That's when you start to see disrespect for rights, because there's nothing to check each other. You need to have both branches be as powerful and fighting each other as possible, because that's how you then make sure that tyranny doesn't result. Right. Right. 
We need we don't need just King Kong. That's bad for the little people on the ground. We need King Kong fighting Godzilla because that creates <laughs> space for the rest of us. Use that in any lecture you like, John, without attribution. So, I offer that for free. I kind of thought, I don't know if you watched these hearings in the House Judiciary Committee with Bill Barr I did, yesterday. I missed it yesterday. Was it oh, good? but he kind of looked like a very depressed King Kong on top of the Empire State Building <laughs> while all these you know little airplanes were swatting. He was just Why swatting them away. He got so tired of it all. <laughs> Traditional executive leadership energy one way that they express themselves is in the president's power of reversal. Trump, you argue, gets the economy moving again. Part of it is statutory. He enacts a tax cut that goes through Congress. But part of it is the president acting on his own authority to reverse regulation after regulation after regulation. The most notorious example of reversing or undoing something that a predecessor has done is Trump's reversal of Obama's immigration policies, you argue, notably the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, or DACA. Why was that a big deal? Why it was, was that a huge constitutionally deal. a big deal? I think it's incredibly important. And of course, I think you've, you've nicely overlooked the fact that my prediction about the Supreme Court standing by Trump on this was utterly wrong. <laughs> I have totally. not, I have not overlooked right. it, John. That comes next. <laughs> so you just give us a little setup on what DACA is and what the president did, and then I'm going to hit you with a hard question. It was, you know, like I think Yoga Berra said this about predictions. It wouldn't be so hard if they weren't about the future. So, okay, DACA, what was it? What did Trump do? So DACA, if you remember, started in 2012. President Obama... Uh, wanted to find a way to allow the dreamers, we call them, to stay in the country. These are people who were brought into the country as children, but in violation of the immigration laws. And now they've grown up, they're in the armed forces or doing public service or in school law. I personally, I would like them to be able to stay. But under they the Constitution- They here through no fault. Of, they, they didn't break the law. Yeah, they didn't break. Right. Well, they, they did break the law, but not intentionally. Not you know? Right, right, right. And-, and yeah, but the Constitution places the power of immigration in Congress. Congress decides how many people get to stay. It decides the categories of people who get to stay. And it funds the Border Patrol and ICE, and they're the ones who you know, detain people and remove them from the country who aren't supposed to be here, legal, who aren't here legally. President Obama comes in and he says, well, Congress won't add the dreamers, so I'm just not going to enforce the immigration laws against that class. And then two years later, he says, and their parents and the parents of people who are here illegally but had children here who are citizens. So he increases it gradually to approximately anywhere from six to eight million aliens who could be removed, who are here in the country illegally. He says, you can stay, we're gonna give you a work permit. So I argue one of the great powers of the president we don't really focus on, and a great check on the president as well, is that one president's deeds can always be undone by the next president in the exact reverse fashion. So, you know, one president appoints a cabinet member, the president can fire them. A president can issue an executive order, the president can remove the executive order. You're, as I'm sure you were, maybe you were there at the beginning of the Reagan administration. I'm sure the Reagan administration spent its first day just de, you know, over, overriding all the Carter That's executive right. orders. That's and right. Carter, I'm sure did that when Ford took over. Um, so it seemed to me just that parallelism meant that when Trump came in, he could do exactly what Obama did, issue an order saying, well, no, we're going to start enforcing the immigration laws at the same rate they were before DACA and DAPA. The remarkable thing, the thing where I was wrong was thinking that the Supreme Court would agree with Trump. And as you saw just a few weeks ago, I think John Roberts I think very mysteriously said, no, 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 if even though Obama did this through an order, President Trump has to go through this thing called the Administrative Procedure Act, which is a two or three year process that Trump has to use to undo that order. So I wrote a piece and I argue in the book, if that's possible, think of all the things that President Trump can do now by deciding I'm not going to enforce the immigration laws either. He could say, anyone who gets a STEM degree in the United States I'm not going to try to remove you from the country. Anybody who brings money invests it in American business. I'm not going to try to remove you from the country. And why does that even have to be limited to immigration? He could also say, I'm not going to enforce federal firearms law. 
you got a gun, you can carry it around. Or how about, gosh, everybody in the country, particularly the ones in the inner cities where the economy is doing so bad, you just pay 50% of the taxes you owe. Ah, oh, the IRS has better things auditing my tax returns than to send them to go chase you down. All right, it all right, really all right, opens all right. up this huge pot, this huge you know, list of options that the Supreme Court opened up, even though it was intending right, to inflict a short-term political rejection to the Trump administration. John, two quotations, and the first is you. Supreme Court blocks Donald Trump's reversal of Barack Obama's actions on DACA. John Yu says, according to Chief Justice Roberts, the Constitution makes it easy for presidents to violate the law, but reversing such violations difficult, especially for their successors. Such a rule upends the text, structure, and history of the Constitution, close quote. Adam White, your friend, your colleague at AEI, which uh, I didn't list all your appointments. You, were appoint you have an appointment more or less everywhere. AEI is one of them. The only place I can't get an appointment is my doctor. <laughs> All right, stop that. <laughs> Adam White, this was just the latest in a string of cases in which Robert's opinions for the court have created or reiterated doctrines mitigating the wild swings in policy. The Chief Justice's focus on the court's institutional role deserves attention and credit. Close quote. So this power of reversal that John Yu makes so much of, and that Donald Trump has used, you argue, to such good effect. In fact, presidents come in, they reverse what the guy before did, they, then the next one comes, that reverses what the woman did, perhaps, someday, and it creates one wild swing after another, such that the, the Supreme Court has to step in and mitigate these wild swings just for the sake of stability. John? Yeah, again, that is the conflict between our 18th century founding constitution and this idea of technocratic management of the government, scientific bureaucracy, right? If you're in the scientific bureaucracy, yes, Adam's right. You wanna have stability. You wanna have expert judgment. You don't want wild swings. But the founders constitution is designed for the people to immediately translate whether we agree or disagree with our government is doing into policy by the electoral process. It's designed to have wild swings of this kind through elections, right? The revolution of 1800, it was called because Thomas Jefferson won the presidency and his party came into Congress. Completely changed public policy, changed in many ways the future of the country. Under this era of the Administrative Procedure Act and making things slower and more deliberate, and transferring all the power to these bureaucracies, I bet the Jeffersonian revolution of 1800 couldn't have happened. Right, right. So it might or might not be reasonable. You let Adam White and Chief Justice Roberts discuss that in the faculty lounge of some fancy law school. What is clear is that it is a constitutional, unconstitutional, a historical and unconstitutional. I think of it as like a tumorous cancer on the body of the constitutions. Okay. Huge growth that won't stop. Right? The bureaucracy will not stop growing. It keeps getting bigger. It is escaping the control politics. And so in a weird way, this power of reversal that you mentioned I talk about is, in a way, again, it's Trump's, again, he may be acting just out of his own political self-interest, right? To say, call it the swamp and say he's draining it. But what he's doing at a, at a higher constitutional level is he's trying to restore political control over the bureaucracy. And you can see, right, the FBI should be independent. Agencies should take their time and not be responsive to the presidency. It is an effort to defeat that kind of political control over the government that the founders thought really that was the, the main check. All right. yeah. Energy in the executive and foreign affairs. Um, you note that the president has reduced the American presence in, among other places, Syria and Afghanistan. Defender in chief, quote, critics conceive of war as presidential adventurism unchecked by congressional fecklessness, but they cannot understand the Trump quandary of a Congress that is more warlike than the president. Explain that, John. Yeah, so uh, again, you know, there's this long-standing debate, again, just on this issue as like the other issues about the scope of presidential power and whether Congress has to declare war before the president can use force. And I've, uh, you know, long argued in this debate. 
that was always built on this idea that presidents get have some kind of political interest in being more activist in, abroad, in intervening in lots of places. And that was Congress that was that should be checking the president, but uh, the presidents had overridden their declared war power and so on. And this is an argument that started in Vietnam and has become a constant feature. What that whole argument was built on was the idea that the president would be more aggressive abroad than Congress. And when you see the polarities reversed, when it's Congress that doesn't want to reduce troops in Germany, it's Congress that doesn't want to leave in Syria, it's Congress that doesn't want to leave Afghanistan, and the president who does, you really see that the Constitution does give the president through the commander in chief power that control over war making because it shows that the Congress can't force a president into war. It can't actually stop a president from withdrawing us from conflicts, no matter how hard he want, it wants. Got it. John, the, the Trump court, the third of the three main ways Trump has defended the Constitution, defender in chief again, Trump has appointed a Supreme Court that could return the Constitution to its original understanding on questions ranging from governmental power to individual liberties. Trump has changed the trajectory of constitutional law. Explain that, John. I, part of that, do you want to take a little bit of that back? Were you a, a little just, you know, you're closing a chapter and you're getting worked up and you, you want to take that back or mute it a little bit? No, I think even his critics would admit that he changed the trajectory. Because think about what would have happened if Hillary Clinton had won uh, and Hillary Clinton had filled the Scalia seat. Right? He would have, you would have had a five, six justice liberal majority. And think about where right, the constitutional agenda of, you mentioned Hillary Clinton's all for getting rid of the Electoral College. Uh, the uh, Democrats, most of them during the primaries were in favor of packing the Supreme Court to 15 justices. Uh, they're the ones who are supporting the idea of independent councils running around criminalizing our political disputes. They're the ones who don't see any limits on federal power, right? They, they're proposing right now a Green New Deal, which would nationalize the energy sector of our economy and transportation sectors of our economy. So, you know, the, I think there was a, it's a real difference between what would have happened in a Clinton court, the kind of people they would appoint, or maybe this will happen uh, with, if Biden were to win, as the polls suggest, mm -hmm. and what and the kind of people Trump picked. But I think Trump, the other thing is Trump has been, ex this will probably be his longest lasting legacy and impact on the constitution, maybe in the way it was with Reagan as well, is the kind of people who put on the Supreme Court and the more, just as important, the dozens and dozens of lower court justice, judges right. he's appointed right are very well-known, committed originalists, people who are, you know, right, believe in interpreting the Constitution based on its original understanding. And I think as someone, I've been involved in judicial appointments for a long time, since early 90s, both Congress and in the executive branch. I think President Trump has picked uh, more outstanding conservative judges and justices to the Supreme Court and the lower courts than any Republican president ever. Mm. So, you know, I, you know, I have to push back a little bit. I've already, we've already talked about Chief Justice Roberts' decision in DACA. Just Chief Justice Roberts is an appointee of George W. Bush, not of Donald Trump, but still, he's meant to be more or less conservative. But that brings us to Neil Gorsuch, whom mm -hmm. Donald Trump appointed to replace the sainted Antonin Scalia. And Gorsuch writes this opinion in Bostock a few weeks ago in which he holds that 1964 legislation, which is legislation to prevent gender discrimination, extends to gay marriage and transgender discrimination, even though those as categories did not exist and did not even were not even thinkable in 1964. He produces this, this opinion which is long and very closely reasoned and you go in at the top and I don't have a, f a sharp enough legal mind to find exactly where he goes wrong but even I know that when you come out at the bottom you're in a crazy place you're just in a crazy place Ted Cruz this judicial rewriting of our laws short-circuited the legislative process and the authority of the electorate close quote that's the kind of language conservatives used to use on Chief Justice Earl Warren 
And yet Ted Cruz is now using it on your man, Trump's man, Neil Gorsuch. He's on my man. He's Trump's man. <laughs> mm -hmm. I actually don't know why Trump doesn't put Ted Cruz on the Supreme Court. I totally, I completely agree with uh, Senator oh, Cruz's description of the opinion. Oh, you do? I'll, well, yeah, all I can say, I'm, I, all I can say is nobody's perfect. <laughs> Even Scalia <laughs> got, got some things that I thought were badly mistaken, like his decision in Smith about uh, the rights of uh, religious groups for freedom of uh, religion, which causes enormous problems even today. And I think Gorsuch, the, th the thing is, I, I think he was wrong. I agree with you. You know, he was quite taken with this kind of law school classroom hypothetical about uh, well, we don't need to get into it, but just about how Title VII of the employment, uh, the 1964 Civil Rights Act worked and how, whether it discriminated on gender. But I can't think of another one that he's gotten badly wrong. And I can't all think right. of one that Kavanaugh's gotten badly wrong on all the important constitutional issues so far. It hasn't been Gorsuch and Kavanaugh giving the fifth vote to liberals. It's been Chief Justice John Roberts, a right. uh, Bush appointee. I great hopes for. I thought he would be great. I think that he's the one who's actually become this sort of rudderless fifth vote in the middle, who's okay. right, the one who, right, he joined Justice Gorsuch's opinion in Bostock. He's the one who provided the fifth vote to strike down Trump's effort to end DACA, right? He's the one who provided the fifth vote on the Louisiana abortion case to uh, strike down Louisa, Louisiana's law. So he's the one who was just the census case from last year. It goes Justice, on Gorsuch, on. Justice Gorsuch, Gorsuch felt, felt victim to temporary insanity. The chief justice is in systematic error at this point. I okay. think so. So let me ask this question, John. Larger point about the court, but it's directly related to your argument about the two views of the Constitution or the two, two views of governance. President Trump relied for his nominees, and you know this in great detail, on, among other institutions, the Federalist Society, which is an organization of conservative or originalist legal minds. You're a member. Uh, it's headed by a, someone we both know called Leonard Leo, who is as brilliant a mind as you can imagine. And they come up with these list of nominees, and as you argue, the Overall, it's just amazing. Not only do they find enough originalists, but they find enough intellectually distinguished originalists. These are people of real accomplishment. All right. Even at that, Gorsuch goes, gives us a lousy decision. Even the Federal Society, not as active as it is now, but George W. Bush, his administration, in which you served, is consulting them as well. And we end up with Chief Justice Roberts, who we, whom we agree is in system, systematic error. Why is it that it is only ever conservative or originalist judges who drift to the left and never, ever, ever liberal judges who move to the center or to the right? Well, I, first, I, I agree with your data. Only we can only think of one Democrat appointed justice who might have moved to the middle. That was Byron White, and actually Isn't he was White. pretty conservative, and he the country just changed around him. Yes, and I think on, that's right. Yeah, and on the the Republican appointed justices has moved to the little. You know, you run out of fingers on your hands. You've got Sandra Day John Paul Stevens, Harry Blackman. You could go on, and then you have Sandra Day O'Connor, Anthony Kennedy, who were in the middle, but we're probably voting more liberal, more than they were conservative by the end. So the question is why, what's the cause of that data? So I have to uh, defer to the views of my former employer and your friend, Judge Lawrence Silberman on the great DC man. circuit. And he gave a great speech about 20 years ago, trying to explain why this was happening. And he said, well, you know, the New York Times Supreme Court reporter for many, many years was a woman named Linda Greenhouse. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, if you uphold Roe versus Wade or you, you know, strike down something that the Reagan administration wanted, you're going to be failure. The New York Times pages are going to be filled with praise for you for growing in office and becoming a judicial statesman. And you'll be invited to fancy seminars in Europe and you'll be judging moot courts at all the best law schools. So Judge Silverman said, I'd like to call that the real greenhouse effect. And I All think right. there's a lot of truth to that. The cultural institutions, media institutions, academic institutions 
are very much on the left. And if you are conservative justice and you evolve, quote unquote, to the middle, you are going to receive the praise and support of all those institutions. It's almost like a hydraulic effect, constantly pushing a point. So uh, what uh, Judge Silverman said was that only people who really have already been attacked, who've been Washington veterans or have been in political high stakes fights, would be people immune to the greenhouse effect. But if you pick people from out in the hinterlands who don't have a lot of experience in politics, mm. who don't know what it's like to be attacked and to survive, they're the ones who are going to be the most vulnerable to this kind of insidious form of praise, he said. I, that's the only thing I can think of. All right. So it's human nature. It's not legal philosophy. It's human nature. People want to be liked. They Unlike you and me, yeah, people no. generally like to be liked. <laughs> All right. Impeachment. <laughs> Defender-in-Chief, House Democrats set a speed record in investigating the Ukraine affair. Democrats were immediately convinced that Trump's quid pro quo justified a rushed process to force his removal from office, close quote. This is just amazing because it's impeachment, which is a major event constitutionally and only took place a few months ago. It says something about the time we live in that it's as though it happened a decade ago. You're going to have to remind us. The Ukraine matter, just give us a brief, Pracy. What was the, give us a statement of facts, Mr. Yu. Hmm. What was the Ukraine right. matter and what was right. the supposed was, quid pro quo? The verdict is rendered right, in end of January, early February. It's not like long ago, but yes, it does seem because of the pandemic that it's receded from our memory. But remember, this is all about a, a phone call in, right. between, in the summer of 2019, just last a year ago from now where President Trump had allegedly called the president of Ukraine and said, could you see if there's some kind of dirt you could dig up on Joe Biden? Uh, we'd really, that would be really helpful to us. And then the claim was President Trump then held up money appropriated by Congress to go to Ukraine as foreign aid. And that was the quid pro quo. Whether that was true or not, and so, you know, this is a common thing you see in the law where you say, accepting the facts to be true, which I'm not. But if I right, were to right, accept right. it, a very effective, argu uh, very effective um, argument technique that works on everyone other than my wife and my mother. But <laughs> accepting the facts to be true, is that really a high crime and misdemeanor? Is that really why the framers put the impeachment power in the Constitution? Or is this more, you know, a dispute? more of a run-of-the-mill dispute. And so part of the argument in the book is, again, this goes back to the beginning of the, your uh, questions, the Electoral College. Again, the founders did not want the president to be subject to the control of Congress. Now, even though the president wasn't picked by Congress, the framers also knew that if you could fire someone, you could control them. That's a fact. The reason why you're fired is not just Trump's favorite tagline, but it is the way the president really controls the executive branch. So too with impeachment, if the Congress can fire the president, the framers were worried that Congress would control the executive and create that merger of the two branches they feared. And so they didn't want impeachment used, I think, for simple foreign disputes, or even, again, accepting the facts to be true, minor abuses of power. They want it to be used for things like treason, for bribery, and we're talking about bribery of foreign nations by of a president. Uh, they had in mind the, Fran the King Louis XIV bribing the English king, which did happen. And that's what they talked about in the ratification. And they were worried that if they made it too easy to impeach, that Congress would be running the whole show. And instead they said, that's why we're gonna make the vote requirement to remove a president, to be two thirds of the Senate, to make sure that impeachment is not a partisan affair, that it's not a matter of interest groups out to get the president. And instead, what is the cure? Well, the cure is what we're seeing now. It should be, the framers very clear, it should be elections. If people believe, if the House finds enough evidence and they put out an impeachment report and the people agree, then they should use the ballot box to remove that president and make their view. That, so I argue in the book and is that uh, the Constitution expects the people to render the verdict in November. So your judgment is that the Senate was certainly correct to acquit. At, 
as also that the House was wrong to indict. Yes, because I don't think it met the standard of high crime and misdemeanor. Right. Trump, may, I'm quoting Defender in Chief, Trump may have acted inappropriately or even abused the executive power over foreign affairs, but Democrats could not show that the Ukraine affair had seriously harmed the nation. Indeed, when all was said and done, the Trump administration had provided greater aid and support to Ukraine than the Obama administration. All right, that's not a high crime or misdemeanor. I don't think so. Right. If it is, then Congress has the president under their thumb. All right. And that's what the framers did not want. Last questions. Defender in chief. If friends had told me on January 21st, 2017, the day the man is sworn in, that I would write a book on Donald Trump as a defender of the Constitution, I would have questioned their sanity. I had not voted for Trump in, in the 2016 primary or general elections. His many personal and professional flaws repelled me. Repelled me? Strong language, John. I saw him as a populist, even a demagogue. Boy, was I wrong. Trump campaigns like a populist, but governs like a constitutional conservative, close quote. I hate being honest. It is the worst. <laughs> John, where does it come from? The, the case you make is actually very dramatic. The argument for a permanent state, for rule by experts, is so powerful that it has infected the thinking of Chief Justice Roberts, that it has taken over the entire Democratic Party so that it's now a centrist position in the Democratic Party as articulated by Hillary Clinton, that we should do away with the Electoral College. The FBI, the CIA, I, I think the CIA was in on it. I, that's not clearly established, but surely James Comey is saying, is saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm an independent actor. I'm an expert. I know how Washington should be run. Trump is out of line. I don't care whether he won the election. I'm above the election. This is deeply ingrained and very powerful. And along comes this real estate casino magnate, reality TV host, Donald Trump, and he stands up for the Constitution of the United States. How did that happen? Yeah, to quote Trump himself, he often says, what the hell is going on? <laughs> 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 and it's a, I think it's an interesting thing how this happened. And it is counterintuitive based on what you read in the press where the one of the common themes is, oh, it's Trump destroying the Constitution, who's tearing down traditions and common understandings. But the, I think part of it is maybe Trump has the virtue of his enemies. It is the people who are so obsessed, I think, with defeating Trump, with impeaching him, with prosecuting him. They're the ones who are... I think twisting and rending the constitutional fabric. And they leave the entire field to Trump to be the one who defends traditionalism, institutions, the constitution. I think it's remarkable. Part of it's political, but part of it's uh, legal too. I mean, we should not have independent councils with vast unlimited powers who are making criminal disputes out of our political fights. But yet it is right, in the quest. The Democrats have once learned that prop, that lesson, right? They did not like Ken Starr and his investigation of Clinton. The independent counsel statute had died. Mm -hmm. But in their quest to get Trump, they wanted to preserve the independence of Mueller and they want to bring back a permanent independent counsel. I think it's the same thing with, and this is part of my argument, that the uh, impeachment and Mueller's investigation are kind of revolt by the bureaucracy against this kind of political control. Right. Trump, he just wants to achieve his agenda, but the way to do it is to increase political control of the bureaucracy though, because the bureaucracy so, is his main enemy. John, is it at this point, uh, Trump, whatever else anybody says, this is my opinion, and whatever else anybody says about Donald Trump, he's an intelligent person and he, He's learning as he goes. All right. So at this point, you've got two arguments here. One, one is the constant, it's the magic of the Constitution. It's so well devised. And the founders were so 
open-eyed about the failings of human nature that they designed a document in which bad people do the right thing. Yeah. Pursuing their self-interest, they, they help to preserve the liberties of the people. Is it that Trump is a, just as much of a blunderer, a self-interested, narcissistic as you thought at first, but the Constitution is such that in defending his own interests, he helps us all? Or at this point, do you begin to admire the man? So look, the founders designed a constitution, as you say, which had a relatively dim view of human nature. Mm -hmm. They talked, there's this famous phrase from the Federalist Papers, again, yeah, it's, that's been my experience. <laughs> so, you know, they said, um, the more you know, I get to know you, John, the more the dimmer my view of human nature becomes. <laughs> <laughs> and we even haven't gone out for a drink at night ever. Wait till we do that, then you're in big trouble. <laughs> If the uh, Madison said, there's a great line, he said, if, if men were angels, you wouldn't need a government. Right. right. Why do you need federalism? Why do you need the separation of powers? Because their lesson they took had been, and mind you, this is even before the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, and the Chinese Revolution, that you know people who come to have a millennialistic view, that they know the right answers, and they want to concentrate all powers in their hands, Right, to do the right thing, that's when government is truly dangerous. Right. Tom Sowell's even have... The Anointed, The Anointed, his book, The Vision of the Anointed. Yeah, yeah. Right. Thomas Tom Sowell's book, The Vision of the Anointed, is, is right. very much along the lines. I don't know if he quotes the Federalist Papers there. I don't remember he did, but it's very much along the lines of the Federalist Papers. And so Trump doesn't have to be a good man or a bad man. He just has to pursue his political self-interest of fighting off Congress and enacting policies that benefit the country to get reelected. And only by doing that, he's performing his constitutional role. So that's, I think that, and you know, what it reminds me a lot of is another great work of the 18th century, Adam Smith, like the wealth of nations of course, yes, about the yes. free market. We, you and I, we buy and sell, like apparently you, you like to buy sketch artists who sit on the sidewalk and will paint pictures of your family, right? <laughs> You, that's a valuable thing to you, right? You, you know, you're pursuing your self-interest. You're making yourself better off, right? But Adam Smith's point was society as a whole benefits when you and I are pursuing our grubby market transactions to, you know, do better than the other guy in the marketplace. I think the founders had a very similar view in a way to the institution of the constitution. The branches pursue their naked political self-interest, but the greater constitutional good is achieved. And so President Trump, that's part of my argument, President Trump achieves that by trying to cut down on this bureaucracy that is like a cancerous tumor, by trying to resist congressional efforts to tell the executive branch how to run, to try to shield political influence from the workers of the government. I don't know if Donald Trump thinks deeply about these things or not. I think I agree. I think he's smart. I think he has political cunning. I think he has a, a sense of how social media and television and campaigning work at, you know, that you and I don't have exactly a very sophisticated level on that, but he doesn't have to be an expert on the constitution to play. To in fact, I would say the smarter you are, the, the more of a constitutional scholar you are, the worse you do. I mean, the, uh, That's Woodrow the Wilson, decision. Yeah. Barack, well, Barack Obama was right. president, allegedly taught constitutional law at the university of Chicago. And then probably the, one of the greatest constitutional scholars ever was Woodrow Wilson. And I think he's done maybe the most damage to the constitution by introducing this you know, Germanic theory of administration and imposing it on our 18th century constitution. Defender in chief one last time, the president did not brandish any novel assaults on the constitution, his opponents did. Democrats would do even more damage to the constitutional order if they were to win the 2020 elections. Assume the Democrats win the House and the Senate and the White House. From a constitutional point of view, give me, give me the first 100 days of the Biden administration. I take them at their word. They would move in a constitutional amendment to get rid of the Electoral College. They would Sorry. add six new justices to the Supreme Court and probably dozens more dozens upon dozens more to the lower federal courts. They would create a permanent independent council. 
they would try to make the attorney general unremovable by the president. They would try to nationalize large parts of the economy. They would add a few more states like DC or Puerto Rico. They, I mean, think about who is actually the constitutional revolutionary here, Joe Biden and his platform or Donald Trump. Mm. John, last question, threshold question, really. Imagine some college kid, imagine a first year 1L at, at, at Berkeley, one of your own students. And this kid, he or she has been told that the Constitution represents an anachronism, the Electoral College makes no sense, the Senate gives too much representation to rural states, and the whole thing was dreamed up by white racists. Why, why does this document, almost 250 years old, remain worth defending? Why does the Constitution of the United States matter? You know, there's, it's a great question. And there's some people who have almost like a religious reverence to the Constitution because it is the founding document. But I would say to younger people, it's like, look at the results. Look at the consequences. Yes, the Constitution is plotting. It is anachronistic. It is slow. That's by design. Let's go to where the fancy theories of government have been tried out. Europe, Asia. Right, look at Europe in the last hundred years. We have had, yes, the slow plotting government, the separation of powers, federalism. It make, I wrote an essay for Hoover. That meant there was never any socialism or communism in the United States because it is so slow. Our government is so decentralized. It makes it almost impossible to concentrate all the power in one hands or in service of one ideology. Look what's happened in Europe the last hundred years. You've had monarchy direct democracy, you've had communism, socialism, and you've had tens of millions of people die at the hands of their own governments because they had the right answer to everything. And if you have the right answer, why let little things like constitutions, separation of powers, federalism get in your way? So one way to think about the constitution and why it's so slow, and I think why it's been in the long run successful it's not just because we're hidden behind two oceans and we have no natural enemies on the continent. It's because we think our constitution is risk averse. The reason why we separate the powers, the reason why we have federalism is because, again, as the founders, they weren't sure we knew the right answers to things. We could try and experiment and try public policies in one part of the country, but not throughout the whole country. Or we would say, if you've got the great idea, then it has to survive the gauntlet of two houses of Congress and the president and judicial review. It's a system that's very suspicious that all of a sudden, right now, we know the right answer to all social problems. Instead, it is one, again, as you said, it's, it's kind of pessimistic about human nature. It's very modest about how much human beings and our own thought can solve persistent social problems. And so I would say to them, yeah, if you know, if you're sure you know the right answer, or more importantly, if you think the person to your left and right knows the right answer <laughs> to everything, then by all means, give them absolute power. Look how it's turned out for the other countries around the world, which is why there is such a long list of people who want to leave all those countries and come to the United States and live under this anachronistic, obsolete constitution. John Yu, author of Defender in Chief, Donald Trump's fight for presidential power. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. For Uncommon Knowledge, the Hoover Institution, and Fox Nation, I'm Peter Robinson.